shut up and sit down. Welcome to the Health and Wealth Podcast with your hosts, Tim and Carter. What's trending in Richards? Carter Wilcoxie, founder of CSI Financial Group here with my co-host and former wealth advisor, Tim James, founder of chemicalfreebody.com and your new health advisor. This is the show where we reveal the connection between physical and financial abundance. <laughs> hey, welcome back in Richards, Carter Wilcox, and coming to you from uh, sunny, warm, uh, quasi-allergy-ridden uh, Phoenix, Arizona. We're going to get into that a little bit, I believe, in this first little segment. But uh, I'm joined, of course, by my fantastic Love When He Poops co-host, Mr. Tim James. That's right. I love to poop. Thank you, Carter, for that great introduction. I appreciate it, brother. <laughs> well, well, Tim and I know that uh, if uh, the Enrichers have been listening to our podcast for a while, and if they, especially if they've seen it, they know your shirt. You got the swag on right now. Love when you poop, right? Because that was not the case when you were going through your own personal journey of healing yourself in a more organic, uh, natural way. But uh, anyway, I'm, yeah. I'm super glad to have you on the show today and and i don't know if we're going to get a chance but i definitely because I, I see you've got the new products on your desk there if you're going to get a chance to talk a little bit about uh before we bring on our guest today which i'm super stoked and excited about talking mm -hmm. with um yes. but uh, i know you got those great new products i don't know if they're both out yet or not um uh, well let's just say yes um the multi shroom is in stock it's in stock we haven't put it on the website yet but by the time people listen to this it probably will be v stack the daily v stack is so for, for you listeners, if you guys are familiar with our Turmeric 100 product, that is a very special product. And the reason why is because we built this or bought this huge this machine that takes raw materials in nature and mechanically just makes them really tiny. So tiny they can go through the blood-brain barrier. The reason why we did this is so we could go through the mucous membrane in the mouth with these tinctures orally directly into the bloodstream, but di then directly into the cell because it's not what you eat, it's what you absorb. And we know with so many digestive tract issues today, the pathway through digestion, uh, you know, maybe 10 to 30 percent of it actually makes it through there, gets into the bloodstream. And then we have bloodstream issues getting it into the cell because of the cellular inflammation, the poor fat membrane and the lack of uh, hydration that people are experiencing. So what we're able to do now is we're coming out with these new tincture lines. That's why we're really excited. So the daily V stack was a solution because we, you know, with the whole pandemic thing going on, everybody was learning about the power of nature and how powerful and vitamin C is and vitamin D3 and zinc and quercetin and vitamin A and, you know, and minerals and stuff like that. So to give you an example, you know, most people aren't aware of this because I wasn't 400,000 international units of vitamin A pulmonate is been proven to knock out the measles. But how many people know this? And then when you hear 400,000, that sounds like a, tr oh, that sounds scary, but there's been no known side effects to anybody doing high dose vitamins, natural vitamins from nature, because your body will use what it needs and it will discard the rest. That's how it works. Yep. Eat too many oranges and you get too much vitamin C, you'll just get rid of it. So, you know, what we're dealing with here is we don't have disease. We have stress, pollution, and nutrient deficiencies. Look at scurvy. Everybody knows what scurvy is because we heard about it growing up. It's not a disease. That's what they thought back then. People were like, oh, they got scurvy. Don't touch them. They're gross. No, they have a vitamin C deficiency. And how they fix that? Lemons and limes. They called the British sailors limeys, right? Yep. So it wasn't they didn't have a disease. They had a nutrient deficiency. So what we were able to do because of this proprietary process, we we're able to get vitamin A, vitamin C, vitamin D3, zinc, quercetin, and a full mineral complex, including fulvic and humic acid, all in one called it V stack vitamin stack or, you know, victory. I'm not going to use the iris word, but you, you can read between the lines and we were able to put them all together and make them equivalent to, you know, 5,000 of this and 10,000 of that, even though on the label, it won't show that because it's the equivalent because it has to make it into the cell because of the proprietary delivery system. We're actually able to, to do that. So that's why these are very profound, powerful products that, that work so well for people. And I'm really excited um, about the multi-shroom because depression is the number one selling pharmaceutical drug. But that tells me that a lot of people have depression, and anxiety issues. And unfortunately, when you get on those <clears throat> synthetic drugs, there's tons of side effects. And it's a, it's just a it's a SHIT show, basically. OK, I've been dealing with people with these issues for a long time. <clears throat> I 
haven't done clinical research or nothing, but we've actually took some of the uh, nootropic um, benefits from like chaga, lion's mane, cordyceps, reishi, shiitake, maitake, and then again, a mineral complex. And we're able, because of this machine we bought, we're able to get all of them into one bottle in absorbed amounts that are equivalent to like eating tons of it. So, and then whatever your body doesn't need, it discards. And all I can tell you is I've been taking these things, man. And you know me, I've been geeking out for 11 years on my health. Very few things move the needle for me very much where I can actually tell. All I can tell you has been going through the taste testing to get the, the products flavoring right. I'm like, I feel good. I feel really good. My yeah. mental clarity, I feel calmer. Even though I thought I was like, you know, I keep reaching these new levels of health and I just keep thinking that I can't reach another better level, but I do. And so I'm very excited to bring these out to the market so we can defend public health and really help people with anxiety and depression issues. How do you take those? How do you take your products, Tim? You just shake them up really, really good. And then you squirt them in your mouth, swish them around. You wait 15 to 30 seconds. and They literally disappear through the mucous membrane and they go right into the blood. And in five minutes, they're in your they're in your blood and then they're going right into the cells. And then th mm -hmm. cross the blood brain barrier. Yeah, it's cool so, because so, so really th those are like droppers. That's what those bottles yep, are. Yeah, it's 20 yeah, drops or I one squirt. Tell if you had to put it on food or in drinks or whatever, but no, you just put it right in your mouth, huh? Just squirt it in your mouth, squirt and go. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Easy. You can get healthy on the fly. <laughs> and that's why you guys don't know this. You has you have you would have no idea about this, but we already shot this episode, a part of it, but there was a fly in the room, and and Carter forgot to push the record button. Yeah. So this is actually deja vu that you don't even know about right now. That's right. That's what they're like, well, I'm having deja vu. Why am I having deja vu? Well, there's a glitch right. in the matrix. That's why. So, I uh, think we're pa almost past the deja vu point. But let's get to our wonderful, amazing, exciting guest today. Yes. We have Danielle Taylor Woods in the house from Tennessee. Woohoo! Hello. Yeah. Welcome. From, uh, yeah, and and by the way, uh, Danielle, you know, pre-show and everything, it was great to get a chance to you know uh, meet you again. I know it's been a while since we first booked you on the uh, on the episode. I know we're we're coming out of tax season and everything, so you got a, you got a little bit of uh, clarity, hopefully happening um, more so as it's gotten a little less crazy uh, with that. I know it's a big part of your practice, which we'll get into in the second segment. But mm -hmm. uh, yeah. And Richard, thanks for joining us again for another episode of the Health and Wealth Podcast. And uh, I want to go ahead and uh, and and find out what was it that got Danielle into not only is she in the financial advisory space, but she's also an attorney or JD um, for from uh, Propel Financial Advisors. So so let's go back in the um, in your earliest remembrance, and I know you're gonna. You know, shared this story with us earlier, but we had that fly in the ointment. <laughs> uh, but uh, yeah, you know, what what was one of your earliest memories on on going the direction of of being into this this area that that is so closely connected on helping people, you know, to and through ultimately retirement? Okay, well, um, I didn't really plan to. It was, it sort of happened on accident. I I had uh, was taking a gap year after college um, and had decided to go to law school and. Um, I decided to go to law school because I really like freedom and I wanted a degree that I could take with me anywhere. I also get bored. So I wanted to make sure that I would always be learning and being able to do something different. And, um, and I also expected to have a family someday and I wanted to be able to work from home. So I thank my 22 year old self on a pretty regular basis for making all of that possible because that's exactly what I've done. And, um, so when I got out of college and I was planning on this gap year, I wanted to find a legal job so that I would know what I was getting myself into and have a leg in somewhere. And I did internships in college and I wanted to make sure I knew what I was getting myself into. And um, the attorney that asked me to come in an interview said, well, um, my husband and I share an office and my husband, uh, her husband was David Vaught, who we talked about earlier, who's my mentor and one of my partners. And um he has his own company and we might just split your time. And I said, well, that sounds fine with me. It falls in with my learn more stuff and don't get bored thing. Mm -hmm. And she was a general practice attorney. She did, you know, bankruptcy, estate planning, uh, divorce, a variety of things. And um, he and his partner were just in two years, uh, had just started a um, independent investment advisory firm. And having just gotten out of college and like most educational 
situations, we didn't learn hardly anything about finance at all. <laughs> so I mean, my parents were very responsible. They taught me to budget. I made my own money. I bought my own car, that sort of thing. But beyond that, I, I didn't know anything. Um, and so when I started working there, um, I got handed a compliance manual and said, you're the compliance person now. And um, I also just had to learn like everything all at once. So it was a fire hose and I loved it. Um, I really just enjoyed the, the fact that you took all these pieces of information and you had to move them around and make them work. And I like helping people. And so that worked out. And um, yeah, that's just kind of how it started. And then after three years of law school, I needed a full time job. And the attorney that I worked for said, I really don't have you know enough work to bring you on full time. But the investment advisory firm had grown by leaps and bounds and they did. And I found that I enjoyed that a lot more. So, um, and that's where I've been ever since. Nice. Awesome. So, um, so you say it happened like by accident. So you had this gap year that happens. Mm -hmm. So when you're in, you know, elementary, junior high, high school, no idea this is where you're going to end up. No, none whatsoever. No. In fact, I didn't decide to go to law school until March of my senior year of uh, college. Wow. So, um, so, but you decided to obviously go to college. So what were you originally, you know, what was it? <laughs> well, that's an even funnier story. Originally, I thought, I don't want to do any more school. I really don't like it. I like learning, but I don't like being in school. And I, uh, my family, none of my family members were college graduates. Like it just wasn't a thing. So they were very supportive, but they never suggested that I go. So really it was like a teacher, my junior year of high school, who said, uh, she's like, well, what are your plans for college? And I was like, I don't know. I don't really plan to go to college. She was like, well, I was a straight A student. I practically had a photo photographic memory when I was young. That is long gone. But um, at the time I did. And she said, well, that's crazy. You've got to go. And so she says, can I was like, I just don't want to, I don't want to be in college forever. I don't know what I want to do. And she said, well, why don't you teach? You get your summers off. And I said, well, that sounds good. So when I decided around junior or senior year of high school to go into teaching, I applied for internships and I was in AP classes and my AP professors kept telling us, you have got to go to a small liberal arts school. Don't go to a big, huge college, go to a small school, figure out what you really like, delve into it. And that's what I did. And I, and I really loved it. I was just sort of burned out on it. Uh, my my uh, degree was in European history, which is a topic I still love. I love going to Europe. I just was sick of it. I had been writing papers for four straight years. Um, when I looked at um, master's degree programs, I felt like it was a step back. I had taken really cool classes like an entire class on the Holocaust, um, an entire class on the breakdown of the Soviet Union, a whole class on 1930s depression in uh, the United States. Um, and suddenly I was looking at courses that were like, you know, the Renaissance from, you know, 1400 to 1700. And I was like, oh, no, 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 no. <laughs> That's the opposite direction I want to go. And I just didn't know what I wanted to do with myself. And I happened to be in the library where I spent a lot of time in college. And one of my classmates was looking at a um, an LSAT manual. Did you all go? Well? All right. I just kind of kicked out. You're, you're good. You're frozen, but we can hear you. Okay. Perfectly. I was like, I'm frozen. Um, but uh, so she threw it across the table to me and I looked at it and I said, oh, I could do that. And that's how I decided to go to law school. Wow. So that's kind of uh, uh, <laughs> totally just like my chance. Yeah, just completely out of nowhere. I really just have always, I've never really had a plan. I just wanted to do something that would make me happy and allow me to do whatever I wanted to do. And that's kind of worked out. Well, Tim. How often do we talk about like um, the frequency, like happiness vibes and stuff like that? Right. Uh, I just talk about it all the time. It's, it's yeah. everything. Everything is frequency. Everybody has a vibrational frequency. And the cool thing about our little existence here in this time, space reality, in these vehicles that we've been getting in our bodies is that we get to choose our frequency literally, which is really awesome. <clears throat> when, when you get that understanding you know, you're no longer a victim because, you know, and the easiest way to sum it up is that, you know, what I was taught was that everything in life is meaningless. And people are like, well, that's weird. That's not true. It is true. Everything in life is meaningless. It it's, it's comes as a neutral prop. It serves double duty. You get to choose or associate the meaning to it. That's, that's what it really boils down to. Yeah. So yeah. We talk about frequency a lot. Absolutely. 
Yeah. And I and, guess uh, I can keep talking about frequency until we get Danielle to join us. Well, and, and, and in fact, Tim, on that note, um, <laughs> She'll come back. yeah, well, of, of course you will. Well, you know, she, it's, uh, it's funny because when Danielle and I were talking earlier before you, you hopped on, uh, you know, pre-show, she's mm -hmm. like, yeah, I've got my, uh, I got my kids and I got my animals and, you know, I don't think there's going to be any way for them to, you know, not distract or bother or whatever. I'm like, you know, it's part of. And maybe the cat just chewed up the, the electrical cord or something. And got <laughs> you just zapped know. like uh, Christmas vacation. Oh, my God. Yeah. <laughs> cat. Poof. <laughs> Squirrels flying out of the tree. That is seriously one of, I mean, Christmas vacation. Uh, Dude, it's so funny. Come on. It's a, it's a classic that every single year it's on our list of like, you know, 10 or 12 movies that we absolutely have to watch every single mm -hmm. year around Christmas time. It's, yeah. I like watching Frosty because when I was a little kid, I liked that one. Frosty, like the old, like, like, yeah, old school Frosty the Snowman, dude. Animated, like, <laughs> that's legit. That's the good stuff. Dude, that, that is legit. There's a lot of, uh, also a Christmas story. You like that one? Well, so I have, uh, of course, a Christmas story. What a ra Daisy Red Rider baby gun. Ah! <laughs> you dry out. Kid. Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> She's yeah, back. I don't know what happened. It said I had internet. Um, we were just oh. talking about frequency and cats exploding. and, uh, <laughs> and uh, I miss all the good stuff. <laughs> oh. Well, we, you know, we were just biding our time. We knew you were going to come back. and we I'm back. You, uh, I don't know how I lost it, but here I am. That's all right. Well, this might be a good time for a break. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Well, um, yeah, unless you had any last, then one more question. Yeah. No, I, I thought the, you know, you and seeking, you know, you just wanted to be happy. I couldn't be happier with you thinking to yourself, well, I just want to do something that's going to make me happy. So, in Richards, if you take nothing else from this podcast away from this, <laughs> look in the if you're not happy with what you're doing, you can choose something different. You can do things that will make you happy. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And another thing that's really important is to realize during that process is to be happy where you're at right now. Cause even if you're a job you don't like, at least it's a job it's providing income and it's providing contrast to let you know more of what you do want. So start enjoying that job because even though you might be moving into another career, enjoy it because who's part of that process of that job or that career that you're in right now, it's you. So if you let it get to you and drag you down, you're dragging you down. And then all other areas of your life are connected to what? You. So your relationships will suffer. Your health will suffer. All these other areas in your spiritual practice will suffer if you suffer at work. Mm -hmm. Be, you know, you see what I'm, yes, you see what I'm getting at here? Yep. Yeah. I, got a, I got a text from a client today who just said, can we pay off our house? Like we are so miserable at work. And I was like, there are so many other things we could do than raid your 401k. <laughs> you know, those are the kinds of questions that I have to answer all the time. I'm sure everybody in our field has to answer all the time. Yeah. For, for, well, for sure. And you know what, that actually is uh, something that we can talk about whenever we come back. So um, Tim, I know that uh, I, I wanted to just make sure that I got that in there about, I, I just love how Danielle talked about, she knew at an early age. And here's something else that I love what you said earlier as well, Danielle. I, my 22 year old self, I think, right. Mm -hmm. On a regular basis. Yeah. And I love that because that type of reflection, right. Can, can definitely help with your law of attraction on whatever it is that is going to make you happy. Mm -hmm. And it's hard to be, I mean, people don't want to be around people that are miserable. Yeah. No. Your relationships suffer. Right. <laughs> right. Absolutely. Yeah. All right, guys. We're going to take a quick break and we get back. We're going to get into what Danielle is doing as she's following her highest excitement in her career. We'll be right back. Estate planning. What does that even mean? When the inevitable happens for everyone on this planet, your estate plan kicks into action. But first, let's start with what an estate is. An estate is simply everything you own. Now, here's the issue and what needs to be understood when this event occurs. You only have two choices on this plan. 
Number one, either you plan how your estate gets handed out and distributed to those you leave behind. Or number two, your state decides who gets everything you own. For the first time ever, you can now take complete and total control of this plan that you've been deprived of for most of your life and generations before you. You can get personalized assistance along the way with a team of specialists whose job it is to make sure you have true peace of mind. It's important to understand that estate planning is a journey and rest assured that our team will be available to you all along the way and at every step. Welcome to eState Plan, home of the last estate plan you'll ever need. To learn more, make sure to reach out to your local advisor licensed with us or go to our website for more information. What's up, Enrichers? Tim James here with my co-host, Carter Wilcox. And today in the house, we've got Daniel Taylor Woods. What a cool name. Uh, maybe I should start calling Hey, Timothy Warren James here. But when I remember, when I hear that, it reminds me of my mom and I'm getting in trouble. So maybe that's why I don't say it. But with Daniel, it sounds really cool. Daniel Taylor Woods. Very, very awesome. All right. From Tennessee, no less. Daniel, well, why don't yeah. you tell us about what you're doing on a daily basis in your career, the things that excite you and how you're helping your clients? Um, you know, I was thinking about that earlier today before we got on this and what, what I want to just kind of talk about my general motto is, and I guess that's kind of what it is, is I want, I want people to be less stressed. I want them to make appropriate middle of the road decisions. These extreme decisions, I, I just, it's just not my personality. I don't like to do it. I tend to think that they have unexpected consequences. Um, not that I can't be impulsive. I can, I mean, I'm, you know, if somebody's like, hey, let's go on a vacation next week. If I can make it happen, I'll do it. Um, right. But I think generally speaking, I really like people to find that balance, um, you know, make the responsible decisions as well as making the ones that just make you happy. Stress is obviously a very important thing to me. I am quick to not quick. I I will cut things out of my life that aren't healthy to be there. Um, I've done it a few times in my life. So when people say, I can't, I can't, I can't, I don't, I don't, I don't fall for it, I guess, because I know it can be done. And like my clients text today when they said, I'm just, we hate our jobs and we're so stressed about money. Can we just like raid our 401k to pay off our house? Would that be a really bad thing? And I said, yes. And because I know them well enough to know that there are a variety of things that they could be doing that isn't that like there's so that's like that's an extreme response to your situation there are a lot of other things that you do so i think that when it comes to what i do all day yeah i mean you you manage money and you um you do the active parts of withdrawing money when you do and helping them make deposits but overall it's trying to help people come up with a process and a plan that makes sense for them um because there is no one size fits all. We don't do model portfolios. We, we take a, an individual, we take their question. We, we've started, you know, well, what's your goal? Like, what is your overall goal? And when somebody says, well, I just need to save as much money as possible. I'm like, that's not a goal. You know, there's no finite number. There's no, that's not a goal. <laughs> that's just an activity. And it doesn't really, how much is as much money as possible? How much do you actually need? And so um, it's having, I guess, turning questions around on clients a lot to really get to the heart of what they, what they really do need or what they do desire and, and trying to find a good middle ground for that. Did that answer your question? Yeah, no, that, that's absolutely awesome. Um, so, you know, it's, it's um, ultimately a, uh, I love your business model. Um, you know, you've oh, got, thanks. you know, the whole, the, the whole tax and attorney and financial advisory and all that stuff and everything. So um, what is the, uh, what's your clientele, you know, like, and, and what is it that, you know, if you get any type of feedback on why they like doing, you know, business, so to speak with, you know, Propel or Danielle, whichever way they, they look at it. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I think that if we were to ask them what their feedback is, is that they like that we're very personable, that we do talk to them individually about specific things at specific times and not just like, well, you need this without their input. You know, I think I've had clients call me up and go, well, I read that you need, you know, $2.2 million before you can retire. And I said, well, that doesn't apply to you necessarily. Let's actually take your 
goals and needs and expenses and how long you think you'll live and all that and plug it into financial planning software. I've helped three different people I can think of off the top of my head retire when they didn't think they could because I was like, I don't see why you can't. You know, there's no reason you can't. Um, I've had other folks who don't save enough or other people who just need to have a serious talking to about, you know, what they're prioritizing. And sometimes it takes a little while, you know, we're not like overly bossy and we'll make a suggestion and then they won't follow it. And a year later, they're like, okay, you did tell me to do that last year. I'm like, "Mm -hmm." (laughs) mm-hmm. Um, but it's all very specific to them. You know, um, we actually talk to them. We spend a lot of time talking to our clients and they take the time to take advantage of us. Some clients don't, you know, sometimes we never hear from them and we feel like they're giving up a lot of good resources there. Cause I think a lot of what we do is like financial counseling, you know, it's really very psychological. Um, and then the other part of what I love to do is just taking all of the, I mean, finances in general, tax, finance, law, it's all incredibly confusing. Um, and so I think what I often start with any conversation with a client is I have a really stupid question or this is going to seem really dumb. And I always say, no, it's not like our this stuff out here is crazy. That's why we have a bunch of professionals running around who have to learn it. And I can't I can't say that I know all of it, but I'm really good at certain things. And my mother team members are really good at other things. And so if somebody asks me a question that I'm not hundred percent confident in, I will tell them that and I'll pull in the team and I'm honest about it. I don't just say, you know, just make something up. I actually try to figure it out. Um, I think one of the things that I like to do the most, as far as the moving the puzzle pieces around is figuring out account types and how they impact you on taxes. I love the idea of tax efficiency. Um, I think a lot of people get sucked into some of these sales pitches that tell them, well, this is tax free. And I'm like, there is very little out there that's tax free, folks. Um, But we can find ways of making it more tax efficient and maximizing for you what you can do. And and we do that, like I said, on a very specific case by case basis um, with a lot of planning. And um, I mean, we listen, but I think I did have a client recently tell somebody else, somebody referred him to me. He talked to me, he goes, well, how's it going? He goes, she's, she tells me the things I need to hear. And that was a, that was a really good compliment. You know, you like to hear that, that you're not just going to say things that make them happy or try to get them, you know, that's not our job. Our job is to give them those hard truths and explain things to them and educate them about the things that impact them and help them make better decisions. You know, we're not always going to be right. um, But we're going to try really, really hard to be as accurate as possible. And, Um, We own up to any mistakes or missteps. And if anything changes, we always have to say, you know, who knows what the law is going to be in six months. (laughs) But right now, that's the best we can do. Yeah, with the information that you have at at, at your hand. It was funny. I was actually speaking to a couple of my uh, uh, employees today and I was just talking about um, the the horrible job that on many levels, but specifically the horrible job that public school has done when it comes to financial literacy. And and the fact that, you know, the the amount of illiteracy when it comes to financial topics and subjects and things like that Mm -hmm. should absolutely be taught, you know, at some level, you know, in in high school for sure. Mm -hmm. And, you know, but but to that point, that's why it, it is. There's a lot of complexity with someone's life. Right. It's not a one size fits all. Mm -hmm. So so you literally um, have to be able to find out and and peel away, peel back the layers of the onion of someone's certain circumstance in order for you to be able to do your advising job. Right. That's why you're Mm -hmm. an advisor on, uh, and why you're specifically a financial advisor. So, uh, you know, with all that being said, you know, what is it that, um, you know, well, first of all, how long have you been now with your firm? Well, our firm split off from our original firm. So our current firm has been in for almost four years now, but this is my 24th, 25th year, 24th year in the industry. Wow. Okay. And then, um, so when you split off four years ago, obviously you're, with the original firm then or the one who split off? I'm just curious. Um, but about half of our firm left the old yeah. firm. So we're the four of us stayed together and um, we're still doing our thing in the way that we think makes sense. 
Um, so what is it that you guys are doing right now? Because it sounds like to me then they're now your competitors. Is that fair? Not really. I mean, it's it's a wide world. We uh, we are the way we do business is very, very different from the way the old firm wanted to do business, which is why we're sure where we're doing what we're doing. So I honestly I don't really think about it as a is a competitor issue. I mean, it's a completely different business model. Gotcha. Which is why you are where you're at and why I guess they're where they're at. Right. Right. Yeah. Well, and, and I said it earlier, I really I really admire your guys' business model. You know, I got a chance to check out your website and, and I've seen some things and obviously you're enlightening the enrichers right now about your, uh, you know, your business model. So you were mentioning earlier that someone that referred you, is that typically how you guys are getting most of your, your new clients? Um, Almost entirely. I mean, and, and that's always been the case. Um, when I started in the business at all, we were doing institutional work for pension funds. And so we started just doing um, like friends and family and then it just kept growing and growing and growing. And all the people we came into contact with through what we were doing were referring individuals. And I just, I really like working with individuals more than I like doing institutions. I feel like you're having more of an impact. You're dealing a lot more with a specific person versus a board or, po I hate politics, hate it. Um, and that was one of the things I really didn't like um, about the other types of, of work that we were doing. I like the individual people. I just didn't like, you know, something could change in a moment. It has nothing to do with quality or or anything. It was just politics. And I I'm just too rational for that. I really I really want to deal with a person who's looking at their own you know, money. And and, you know, I'm very cognizant of the fact that we have been given a whole lot of trust over somebody's entire life savings. I mean, I take that very, very um, seriously. And, um, you know, at some point you become a very, like, almost like a part of the family. I've been invited to weddings and you know, talk to my kids now that they're old enough and you need to talk to my friends. And if something happens to me, you need to know about this. Um, and I, I appreciate that. It's nice. So uh, let, let's talk about the, um, the effects, because you said it's been four years now with, with the the breakaway or whatever way you want to look at it. Uh, uh, well, half of that has been during um, these recent events. Some, I don't know if you're aware or not. Something happened. Yeah. <laughs> a little bit. Yeah. yeah. So I, I'm just wondering, you know, how have things, you know, changed with regards to how you do, uh, you know, planning and how you're doing meetings and, uh, you know, ha have you guys done a lot more like virtual type of stuff? Uh, it looked, it, you know, I don't know if you're working more from home yeah. or, how did that affect yeah. you as far as the way that you're communicating with your clientele? Well, the great thing about it was that when we when we left, um, we were already, I have three other partners. One of them, I live in East Tennessee. One lives in Chicago. Um, one lives in Brooklyn. And the other is sort of a nomad between Florida and Illinois and relatives' houses. And so we, and we were, you know, a small firm. We didn't have money for a building for rent. You know, it was like, okay, how are we going to keep ourselves afloat with the clients we brought with us? And and get going. And um, having an office was not on the list. You know, it was just a big expense that we couldn't afford. And so we were already working virtually. And I mean, I've had clients for 20 years. So they're just, they're used to talking to me on the phone or seeing me when I'm just local or, or just seeing me over email, you know, talking over email. And so that was not a big change for us. We were really built for, for COVID <laughs> anyway. Um, but instead of seeing people in person a little bit more often. We've done a lot more Zoom. Um, I've, I've taught clients how to use Zoom. I'm like, oh, it's your first time. So we, you know, we do that together. We've done, we started doing webinars um, instead of doing in-person meetings, which is what we used to do. We'd have, a, you know, like an educational event and we'd invite people. And, and it was nice to see people in person, but you couldn't get everybody. You know, we've got clients all over the place. So it was a better way to reach out to everyone um, when we did it. So that part was really easy. Nice. Yeah. So, so really no big transition whatsoever for no, you. No, we were, we were totally built for it. Nice. Nice. Mm -hmm. So um, let's talk about a little bit about you, you know, you've had clients you said for 20 years. So that goes to your client retention model. Uh, mm -hmm. so obviously you're doing something very yeah. well there. So what if, uh, you know, if you could break it down, you know, you know, age wise, you know, what, what is your youngest client? Uh, all the way up to your oldest client that you guys are, or maybe you just personally are advising. I mean, our youngest client is probably 23. 
and our oldest client is 92. I mean, they're, they're really, again, when they're all referrals, um, pretty much everybody's a referral or somebody I've had for a really long time has referred somebody. We have them all over the place. So, um, which is nice because then you're, you're getting to, you're somebody you already know and trust and have a relationship with saying, I wouldn't, I wouldn't suggest this person if I didn't think, you know, it was a good fit or if I thought they were a big pain in the butt and they were going to make your life miserable. <laughs> so that's nice. We already have sort of vetting done for us, you know, before they, before we, they come in and, and we get a chance. To, and I, and I tell clients that too, when we, when we meet, you know, our, for the first time I say, you're interviewing me as much as I'm interviewing you. Like I have, all these other people to take care of. And if this doesn't make sense, it's just going to take time away from my other clients who trust me and to do my job who have been trusting me all this time. I'm not going to do that to them. So um, I thankfully have been doing this long enough to have a good feel for that. And um, I don't usually have to turn a client away, but um, you know, I don't push too hard. Like if you meet somebody, you kind of get the feel like this isn't going to work. You're like, okay, well, just let us know. And, you know, if we don't hear from them again, we don't hear from them again. It's no loss, really, because I've been through it enough where you try to push that round peg into a square hole and you just regret it. Um, so client retention is is excellent. I mean, we really don't have any issues with client retention whatsoever. Yeah, that's, that, that's awesome. So, um, so it sounds like then, you know, you, you're you're very selective and, you know, you don't want to waste anybody's time, especially your own. Yeah. Uh, just for the, the, the right type of, uh, um, you know, assets that, you know, you could be able to, to manage or w exactly how you guys are, you know, you're, right. you're, you're fiduciary, right? So you guys are doing yes. a lot of AUM, correct? Yeah. Yeah. Almost exclusively. Um, yeah, we do some financial planning. And during COVID, if there was a positive, we've got a lot more interest in financial planning. You know, a lot of people are like, I don't want to do this the rest of my life. Or I thought I was going to retire in 10 years. I want to retire in five. When, you know, what do we got to do to make this happen? Um, so that's been really good because I think people need to do it more. Um, I'm constantly amazed at what people will spend money on and declare that financial expenses aren't, they don't make the cut, you know, um, whether it's saving for themselves or, paying us or making a plan for themselves. And it's just like, I know what you spend money on everything else. You know, it's, it's hard to, I get frustrated with that, that not, not my clients necessarily, but people in general, they just have a very hard time accepting that this is an important thing to spend money on. Yeah. Well, no, it's an investment. Yeah. Right. Right. And I, I guess, I'm a very proactive person, obviously. I like to get ahead of problems before they become problems. I've been doing this long enough to know that fixing problems is a far more stressful and expensive endeavor than doing it right the first time. And um, it's something that I push on people all the time. You know, I said, yeah, you know, you're going to pay me to do this, but if we make a mistake, it's going to cost this much to fix it, you know, and not to mention all the lost sleep and, you know, blah, blah, blah. So, Thankfully, having done it as long as I have with as many people as I have, I have lots of horror stories to share. So I'm not just making it up and I'm not just trying to, you know, churn fees on something. It's it's based on a reality that I'm well aware of. Well, that's not, that's not like a perfect segue, Tim. To, Good uh, stuff. Yeah. Good stuff. You yeah. know, it's, it's, it, if you notice that I would say most of the people that we have that are gravitating on this show um, actually care about their clients. What a <laughs> yes, quite refreshing. Uh, there's a lot of people right. out there in yeah. all industries. The other thing I like to point out to people is that as frustrating as what we do is, and when the market has a lousy period or a new law comes out, it's so frustrating. I said, I have a job where people say thank you to me multiple times a day. You know, I mean, most, a lot of people don't have that. And it's nice that you feel like you're doing something useful and people say thank you. You know, there's there are a lot of positives to that. Well, yeah, Danielle, you know what I love about uh, what it was you were saying earlier and what Tim was just alluding to is that you care so much about your clients. You'll even tell them things that they don't want to hear. Mm -hmm. That's how much you care about them. Yeah. Yeah, that's all. Yep. Yep. That was our motto when I was an advisor was we we tell you what you need to know, not what you want to hear. And a lot of people will tell people what they want to hear. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't really help you in the real world. So, right. And we say there's a difference between planning and selling. You know, mm -hmm. our job is to help you plan. Yep. And then here's the tools that best fit that. Mm -hmm. So great section uh, segment, uh, Daniel. We're going to take a quick break and then when we get back. 
now it's time to do the fun stuff. We're going to talk about health, my one of my favorite topics. So, Daniel, we'll, we'll allow you to ask me any question on health, and we will be right back. Okay. You want the absolute best for yourself, and you want it to be easy. That's why we created Green 85. It helps with detoxifying the body gently. We're proud it's chemical-free, unlike almost all other supplements you'll find. Bottom line, Green 85 will get you healthier. We look forward to hearing what Green 85 did for you. To get this product and our other amazing products, go to chemicalfreebody.com. That's chemicalfreebody.com. What's up, Enrichers? Tim James here. I'm back with my co-host, Carter Wilcoxon. Again, today in the house, we have Daniel Taylor Woods. Daniel, this is the section of the show where we get to turn the tables and you get to ask the questions. And you can ask me any question you want on health. So what is your question or questions? Okay. Well, um, we were kind of talking in the off time about how I'm trying to come up with something different because I know you've gotten tons of questions. Um, so I'm trying to come up with something that sort of falls into line with what I deal with all day and, and the sort of uh, general processes that go on. And um, the healthcare, uh, lots, lots of people have lots of concerns about the healthcare system. Um, COVID really created that as well. And I guess as somebody who is generally healthy, so I'm not in the healthcare system that much, but I have dealt with it for things that were beyond you know, we have heart conditions in the family that are not brought on by poor eating. It's just congenital issues, that sort of thing. I guess my my question is. Maybe my question should be about kids, because I have kids and I'm always trying to explain to them. In general, how to be more proactive about their own health and not blaming a system for their for its its faults and how you can be a better part of that system and that's not a good way to put the question so let me think some more about how to put it. i think it'll be more like well a, I, I actually go ahead. if you can find a way of putting find yeah because i think what you're at what you know correct me if i'm wrong but i think you're just asking how do i help my kids get this yeah right there so you go. That's they, a good can under, they, they can understand what's really going on and and the best way to make sure that ensure that your children get it are is to lead by example. Like you be healthy. And then during that process of you being really healthy and happy, you hand them the permission slip to do the same thing. And then during that, um, you can educate them on you can say, hey, look, you know, the medical system and you can just you could actually take them back in history and show them Western. You know, for tens of thousands of years, it was indigenous medicines and healers you can look at the ayurvedic and uh, uh ayurvedic medicine there's ayurvedic and or called siddhar healers is another version of ayurvedic medicine and they were using herbs and stuff like that you know a perfect example is like um well my formulator you know he was supposed to be a medical doctor went to cornell university walked away from it went to naturopathic school and said it's not good enough either walked away from that and um flew to india and studied under thousands of years of apprenticeship and mastery and he learned to become a, uh, uh, a he became a master herbalist in Indian herbology, and he actually got to see patients coming in every day into these clinics, and these healers working with them, and then prescribing certain herbs and and yoga postures and meditations and certain massage or whatever they needed for their specific condition. And these people, they were teaching them how to heal themselves. They would mm -hmm. guide them and they would help them with the formulations that have been handed down and tried and tested and true this is actually what we found out is that ayurvedic medicine is actually steeped in ten thousand years of system science like so the new field after the genome project failed out of mit is biological engineering so finally finally they're taking an engineering standpoint or approach to medicine and human biology which has not been done before because engineers can't make mistakes otherwise people die Right. Engineers build bridges and buildings yeah. and if they mess up or planes and the plane crashes or whatever, it's on the engineer. Right. Because mm -hmm. they didn't it wasn't thought out. And that's why engineers are so they, they, they they're very they, they, everything has to be perfect mm -hmm. because if they don't, people die. They're finally taking that approach and looking at the human body as a complete system and looking at all the interconnected parts of that system rather than just decompartmentalizing. Oh, your foot's bad. Go see the podiatrist. Oh, your gastrointestinals tracks messed up go see the gastroenterologist oh your eyes are messed up go see the optometrist and misunderstanding that 
everything's connected. Like when you go to your, that's why your dentist is probably the most important person. The doctor that you're going to have in your team is because it's because the gateway to all health is your mouth, like the oral microbiome. Mm -hmm. So important. And if it gets off, it's going to disrupt your cardiovascular system, your heart, you know, yeah. your lymphatic system, your garbage removal system, your neural system, your brain, all this can be affected by this pathway, this gateway of your mouth. So that's why, you know, masks are really a, actually a really bad thing for the human body and anybody that wears them because you're disrupting airflow, increasing acidity and temperature of the mouth. And you're breeding four of the 700 bacteria that are bad. Um, the other, you know, 696 are awesome. They're part of your immune system, but they get out of control. And that's why dentists are reporting a 50% increase in, you know, like uh, rotting teeth, uh, gum disease and cracking teeth and mask mouth, they call it. Um, because we're doing something very unnatural, trying to, you know, out of fear, trying to hide from a virus that is so small that 97% of it flies through these cloth masks. Mm -hmm. So we're, we're really, you know, there now, when you take an engineering standpoint and you learn about what masks do to the body, you would never put one on your body because you find out that you actually increase your chances of a respiratory infection by 13 times by wearing a mask, doing mm -hmm. the exact opposite of what everybody's been told. But see, it's not about what the news says or, you know, what you think or what your feelings are. It's about an engineering approach. What's actually happening in the real world when you put on a mask, just as an example, right? So with that approach, now think that tables are going to, as people start understanding this and looking at the body as a whole system, we're going to start seeing um, hopefully some changes in medicine because the current approach is like, it's archaic. I mean, we're literally looking at a 60 to 100 year old version of the immune system and all of big pharma and all of Western medicine is going off of that. But that's an old, old way of looking at things. Things mm -hmm. have changed. Like, you know, the horse and the buggy was great back in the day, but now we've got, you know, we've got cars and they're a little bit better system. Now, maybe not better for the environment because of the engines and stuff, because it's not, you know, free energy that we're using. But, you know, it, it goes faster, longer, farther than a you know, horses and you can get where somewhere faster. So things change. We need to change with it, but the medical system's lagging behind like literally 60 to hundred years right now, even though we have amazing diagnostic equipment. So these are things you can start sharing with your children. And then mm -hmm. you can also show them in history that Western medicine um, uh, was actually born out of wartime and it's crisis management. So that's why they, ex we excel in the emergency rooms. Mm -hmm. It's best. Like if you get hurt, you get an accident, that's where you want to go. Yeah, but when you have a chronic mm -hmm. issue, they've it's a fail, make a major fail because they're based on the sixty at best to a hundred year old system of the immune system, and they they compartmentalize us and they forget about the interconnections. So these are things you can teach your children. Yeah. And but again, the best way is to live a healthy life and be healthy yourself. We actually lost our intern, uh, our internal medicine doctor. We had a primary physician who was an internal medicine, which was what we really wanted. For that reason, we wanted somebody who was going to and we lost her to holistic medicine. We haven't found her. I don't know where she went, but she was wonderful. We loved her for that reason. And I get I realized as you were talking that what you were talking about was exactly what I was aiming for was this balance in in healthcare. You know, I think people when they need to lose weight, they try to change everything about themselves overnight and wonder why it doesn't work. You know, and some people think, well, I need to get rid of all processed foods. And actually, obviously, of course we do. But sure. having something easy to prepare for dinner once in a while also reduces your stress. So you have to find ways of being somewhere in the middle about everything. And these extreme responses to everything are not helpful. Well, baby steps is the way to go. Because uh, if you're making a, if you take a step every day in the right direction, it's as, you know, as most financial advisors know, the mm -hmm. eighth wonder of the world is what? It's compounding interest. It grows mm -hmm. like a snail. And then all of a sudden, zoom, it takes yep. off in those last few years. So it's the same thing with your health. You just start somewhere. Start doing something. You don't have to go to the gym for three hours and kill yourself. And then the next yeah. day you can't move and to hell with all this. Just go walk <laughs> to the mailbox and then walk around the block and walk around three blocks. We talk about mm -hmm. this. And maybe, you know, a year and a half into it, you're going to, you and your friend will run a 5K. Yeah. You know? That's how you do it. And then you built yourself up to it. So. It's um, the journey is more important than it's not like a sprint. It's you're going to do this for the rest of your life. So you have to create a lifestyle and an environment that supports this natural human frame, this biological system. That's it's a piece of nature, no different than a, a mm -hmm. pine tree or an ant or a worm. You know, we we're nature. So.
Yeah. And it goes, back, any to other? Goal, it goes Go back to that goal oriented thing. Like, well, I need to lose 20 pounds. Why? Well, you know, why, why do you need to lose 20 pounds? What's the goal? You know, is the goal to be happier? Is the goal to wear that dress? Is the goal, you need a goal, right? Or you're just going to keep throwing yourself at things until something sticks, if it ever sticks. Mm -hmm. Well, usually the weight loss stuff is just, you know, there's so many things. I usually let people off the hook because a half of this stuff is not your fault. Mm -hmm. Like the stuff that they're putting in foods today and the stress right. that's being propagated out there with the news. Like if you want to lose mm -hmm. weight, turn off the news, get off of social media, get yeah. away from all this BS, you know, mm -hmm. get, and go lower in the food chain, get away from the processed foods. Like somebody said, I was on a show the other day. They said, just get away from things with ingredients. Mm-hmm. Buy foods that just come as food. Yeah. Like eat lower on the food chain. And I was like, oh yeah. I was like, that makes sense because if you look at um, you know, people are gonna I still buy stuff with ingredients. You want to read the ingredients, but if you look mm -hmm. at um back in the 14, 1500s, the peasants were healthy because they were eating lower on the food chain and mostly mm -hmm. plant-based diet. The kings and the people that were wealthy, they were the ones that were overweight and had all the disease. Right. Like people don't realize like back in the day, like sugar was like hard to come by. And it was like prized and because right. you know, it was like cocaine, basically. It's actually yeah. one you molecule. Had to be, you had to be rich to have it. Yeah. <laughs> the structure of co sugar is almost it's identical to cocaine, actually. It's three times as addictive as cocaine. So think about that mm -hmm. as you make your cookies. Yeah. So um, <laughs> when you when you when you have somebody that uh, like these these kings and stuff, the sugar would be locked up. It was under lock and key and was only brought out for birthdays and hol holidays and weddings and parties and stuff like that. But now, and the kings were all messed up with their health. But now, guess what? Everybody has access to sugar because they've made it very accessible with the sugar industry and sugar beets and GMO. They, this they put it in things that don't even need sugar. Everything because mm -hmm. it works and it sells and it's it's hitting a receptor in the body, right? Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, it's very acid and it destroys human health, like destroys your health, like yeah. period, like destroying it. So, um, but it's very addictive. Like mm -hmm. I said, it's. Three times more addictive than cocaine. So when you tell somebody like, I'm going to quit sugar, that's like walking up to a cocaine addict and say, you know what? You should quit cocaine because it's really bad for you. It's destroying your health. And they're like, you know what? You're right. I'm going to quit. It just doesn't go down like that. <laughs> you have to hit rock bottom and they mm -hmm. finally have to realize that it's not working. It has to be their own realization. It's the same thing with sugar. It goes deeper. The food stuff is easy. Like changing this and changing that's easy, but getting mm -hmm. people to do it because this is an emotional battle is, is, is that's where the work lies because it's not just the addictive, super addictive stuff they've programmed for you to eat that hits on your receptors and makes you crave more and more like chips where you can't put the chips down. Um, it's the emotional baggage you've been carrying around since your childhood, possibly, or a death or your molestation or whatever happened. And you're using food as the dope to push these emotions back down so you don't have to feel them. But I'm here to tell you that you need to let them come up and you need to cry because the crying is actually a physical detox of those emotions. Mm -hmm. And until you do that, you're going to be harboring disease inside of you and you're going to feel weighted down and heavy. And I've actually went through this process where I've had uh, crying sessions. It just happened as I was healing myself from other stuff. And um, I felt like I was floating around on a magic carpet. I had no idea how emotions can weigh you down. Like, like literally, I felt like I was floating around on a magic carpet. I felt lighter, you know, like I was pack carrying around a backpack. And then all of a sudden, like an ethereal backpack, and it was all of a sudden it's gone. And like physically, you feel lighter. Mm -hmm. like your steps are lighter. You just feel more things are possible and you can get more done. It was it was kind of quite remarkable so and for the guys out there listening oh i'm never gonna cry i'm too tough well go ahead and wear that wear that then because it's going to manifest itself and it's not going to manifest in a good way it's like not manly to cry don't don't be a sissy don't be a girl you know that's what we're told <laughs> as kids. it's like look dude we have emotions we have tear ducts i mean it's like you you're storing this shit in your cells and it's dragging your life and your ass down is that really what you want? Don't you want to be happy? I mean, mm -hmm. what kind of an example are you setting for your children? You want to be macho and, uh, you know, m messed up with your health because you're macho? Like, let it go. Don't let mm -hmm. society or, you know, I read a book called uh, Being in Love by a guy named Osho. It's a great book. Completely flips paradigms on. It's like, whoa. He said the first thing you need to do is get rid of your parents. Not like physically, but get rid of all the crap <laughs> from society that was put on them and they put on you. And you mm -hmm. got to get rid of you got to get rid of uh, all the societal conditioning as well. It's not serving you. 
So what's happening right now, if you guys have noticed this, but our world's consciousness is, is picking up right now. It's getting raised. And that's how things are going to change. As we individually raise our consciousness um, and become more enlightened, that's how things are going to change. So anyway, great question. I appreciate it. Yeah. Did you have any other questions about health for yourself, family, or just public health in general? No, we kind of rambled our way through that one, didn't we? Yeah, you got mm-hmm. where I wanted to go. Sweet. Well, we appreciate you coming on the show, Danielle. Thanks it's been awesome. Um, you have a great uh, vibe to you, and I hope people will oh, thank you. check out your website, especially those in the local area where she's at, and go see her. Or um, Even remotely, you probably can help people remotely, right? Oh, yeah. I, that's how I mostly help people, yeah. Okay, cool. <laughs> All right, take us home, Carter. That is awesome. Uh, thank you, Tim James. Uh, hey, Enrichers, thank you so much again for joining us for another episode of the Health and Wealth Podcast. To be able to see all of our other previous wonderful guests like Danielle Woods, you can go to our website at www.thehealthandwealthpodcastshow.com and make sure to like, share, and subscribe wherever you get your podcasts, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or Google. Um, so for my fantastic Love when you poop co-host, Mr. Chemical Free Body himself, Tim James. Uh, I'm Carter Wilcoxon. Thanking you very much for joining us again for another episode. And Danielle, again, absolutely been our pleasure having you on the show today. Thank and you. We really, really enjoyed it. And I'm sure that our audience did as well. Awesome. So, hey, until next time, Enrichers, I'm Carter Wilcoxon. Wishing you all a wonderful Save day. Save by the bell. Hey, Save by the bell. Have a great day. Hi guys. Hey, Enrichers. Thanks for tuning in to another episode of the Health and Wealth Podcast. I'm your host, Carter Wilcoxon. And I'm your host, Tim James. And by God, we are committed to helping you guys have fat wallets, flat bellies. So tune in again for another episode and make sure to like, share, and drink a lot of water. Or beer. You have just listened to the Health and Wealth Podcast with Carter and Tim.